Okay, um, let's uh, go get go ahead and get started. Um, I do need to apologize for something I said in class yesterday. Um, it's a poor choice of language on my part, and uh, I was made aware of a circumstance that made that particular choice of language particularly inappropriate. Uh, namely, when I was, um, I, I was informed that um, a few days ago, um, uh, one of our uh, computer science majors committed suicide, uh, which means me joking about killing myself if I don't have anywhere, you know, that, that was really, really inappropriate, and I apologize, especially if anyone, if any of you know the the, the, the student in question, uh, that really probably distracted you from everything else that I was saying for the rest of the day. Uh, so please accept my sincere apologies for that. Um, it's a difficult situation that unfortunately uh, we do encounter every, um, uh, every so often uh, that students for whatever reason, um, find themselves overwhelmed and or isolated and or depressed. I do want to emphasize that uh, if you find yourself getting overwhelmed, if you find yourself isolated, if you find yourself depressed for whatever reason, be it um, family issues, money issues, class um, course issues, uh, significant other issues, what have you, please remember that you do not have to suffer through this alone, and please remember that depression is not a weakness, but it is an illness. And like other illnesses, it often responds well to treatment by professionals. Um, if you can't afford to talk to a professional, call it McKinley. Um, if it's an emergency situation, despite the fact that they're overwhelmed, they will make room for you. Um, if you call in the morning, they will make appointments the same day. If you're not comfortable talking to a professional, talk to someone in your family, talk to your friends, talk to a member of the clergy, talk to some trusted mentor. Um, you're welcome if you believe it is appropriate to come talk to me, but I am likely to say I'm untrained. Um, I'm happy to lend an ear if it's appropriate for me to do so, but um, I, I can't actually be uh, any kind of formal counseling because I haven't been trained in doing that. Um, so again, um, it's an unfortunate situation that I was unaware of, but nevertheless, when I said, made jokes about it, um, especially under the circumstances that was inappropriate. And for that, I am um, sincerely sorry. Um, I'm happy to answer questions if you have any, but there's a limit to what I can actually tell you about this, the situation, given the, you know, there's, I can't reveal who um, or under what circumstances or anything else. So. Um, Okay. Um, so we finished up on Tuesday with most of the material on regular languages, context-free languages, finite automata, NFAs, fooling sets, that sort of stuff. The material that we'll be covering on midterm one. There was one step that I didn't get to, and I said, we're going to do it on Thursday, which is how to go from a DFA to a regular language. Because we're never going to ask you to apply this algorithm, we're not going to cover this today. Um, there's a point later in the semester where it makes sense to refer back to this and say, hey, you know, this shortest path algorithm that we're talking about, if you just tweak it a little bit in the following way, you get an algorithm to solve this DFA to regular expression problem. 
Um, so uh, if you're curious, the details are in the notes, which are posted to the website now. Um, it's a cool algorithm, but really we need to move on um, to the different to the next part of the course. I'm happy to answer questions about this if people are curious. Um, but as I said, um, this is something that is likely to make a bit more sense in about three or four weeks when we're, we've been discussing recursive algorithms and graph algorithms for a while, since this really is just a recursive graph algorithm. Okay. So I, I said I, would pro I, I promised you that I would do this, and I will do it in the following sentence. Details are in the notes. OK. Um, all right, so um, what we're doing for the next chunk of the course is really focusing on the first word in the uh, title of the course, algorithms. Now, we've been doing algorithms for three weeks. A DFA is an algorithm. An NFA is sort of an algorithm. Um, we've described algorithms to transform regular expressions into NFAs. We've described algorithms to transform NFAs into DFAs, or given an NFA with epsilon transitions, turn it into an NFA without. There are algorithms in the notes for transforming DFAs back into regular expressions, for taking a, a, a DFA and reducing it down to the minimum number of states. Um, we've been doing algorithms all along. But we've been doing it in this very restricted context of playing mostly with regular languages. And so now I want to step back and talk about basically the two single most important abstractions, both of which we've already used, but I wanted to spend um, some time talking about each one. Um, the, the, the first abstraction is uh, is recursion. Now we've been doing recursion already. You know, when I said, "How do you transform an N a regular expression into an NFA?" I say, "Well, you look at the most significant operator. You recursively construct an NFA for the the sub expressions, and then you glue them together according to one of these few cases. And there's some base cases, right? Um, but I want to spend some time thinking about what recursion is." And, and how I recommend thinking about it, um, short version is, it's magic. Treat it as magic. Do not open the box. Do not look behind the curtain. There is no stack. It's magic, okay? Um, the other, uh, the other um, abstraction that, again, we've been using um, for most of the, the semester so far, is um, being able to reason about and compute with and model things as graphs. Nodes, edges, maybe directed, maybe not. Um, most of the, the, the problems we're going to th be thinking about with recursion just have to do with arrays, strings, just like we've been doing before. Um, graphs will kind of float around in the background, but they won't play a significant part in what we're talking about for a couple more weeks. All right. um, and then once we've really dealt with you know, the different kinds of recursive algorithms that, that I think more or less everybody needs to know about, we'll step back and start talking about graphs as an explicit object that we want to manipulate, not necessarily NFAs and DFAs, but arbitrary graphs, which show up absolutely everywhere and um, look at a few of the really most significant, um, most important algorithms that one needs to know, some of which, again, we've actually um, already used. Okay? So I'm going to start here. All right? And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is review, especially since we've already been doing recursion um, uh, some of the stuff is going to sound perhaps a little bit elementary, but I do want to emphasize this is, in some sense, I'm going back to the beginning um, for the same reason that you know professional musicians practice their scales, um, because sometimes it's good to go back to the beginning and say, you know, 
let's, let's firm up on the fundamentals. So um, the canonical um, recursive uh, um, problem that I want to start with is the Tower of Hanoi problem. Um, now, I know better than to ask this question in the positive sense, so let me ask it negatively. How many of you have never heard of the Tower of Hanoi problem? Good. So um, that means you all know how to solve it. What's the first step in solving the Tower of Hanoi problem? I want to get those disks, that, well, okay, they're bars, but pretend they're disks. I want to move them from that, that, that stick over to the stick on the right. What is the very first thing that I should, be, that I should think of doing? Yes? No. Sorry? Uh, well, I guess in a trivial sense, yes. One, okay. If, no, decide if it's zero or not. If it's zero, if there are no disks to move, how do you move them? Right. Okay. So let's suppose there's more than zero. Yes. Okay, so this is close. So the suggestion was solve for n minus one. Um, I really, I'm, I'm deadly serious about this. I want you to think of this smaller problem. I need to move those n minus one things out of the way as someone else's problem. That someone else I will consistently refer to as the recursion fairy. The recursion fairy has a magic wand. You do not know how it works. You do not care how it works. Um, the point is that you've reduced the problem of moving these end disks from left to right. So the first step is, what? well, the first thing I have to do is I have to get these n minus 1 disks out of the way. And then you notice, hey, that's actually the same problem. right? It's a smaller version of the same problem. And therefore, someone else will take care of it for me. I don't have to. Okay? And so the way, the, the very first step in solving the Tower of Hanoi problem is to call it the recursion fairy and say, hey, we moved that out of the way. And the recursion fairy says, okay. What's the second step? Oh, everything is out of the way. So this one, I actually get to do some work. Done. And what's the last step? I say, hey, I've got n minus 1 disks that I've got to move from where they are to somewhere else. That's a smaller version of exactly the same problem. Hey, recursion fairy, could you uh, move those for me? And the recursion fairy says, OK, done. Three steps. The Tower of Hanoi problem requires three steps. Recurse, move, recurse. Okay, now, inevitably, there's a question that pops up into um, almost everyone's mind, especially, I know you're, you're not seeing this for the first time, but um, uh, inevitably, the question comes up, how did the recursion fairy move those n minus 1 disks? And the answer is magic. And then they say, no, 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 no. I'm writing code. It actually is going to go into a real computer. It's not some magical abstraction. I have real code that I'm going to write that will really do this thing. And I want to know what the computer is going to do to move the, those n minus 1 disks. And I will insist the answer is magic. If you're in an, you know, especially if you're, you know, used to being t looking at low-level system architecture, computer engineering type stuff, you think, oh, well, you know, there's a stack frame, there's a that th that you there's a call stack, and you push the variables on, and you establish a new stack frame, and the 
program counter does like this, and then you do something, and eventually it comes back and pops off. No, none of that exists in this class. It's magic. So the next question is, how do I know that it works? How do I know that this magic works? And whenever you ask the question, how do you know, the last word in that question is actually slightly wrong. The proper question to ask is, how do you prove? How do you prove that this recursive algorithm will work? Induction. induction. And what is the induction hypothesis? The recursion fairy does its job. That's the induction hypothesis. For all integers less than n, the recursion fairy correctly moves, can correctly move um, that many disks from one stick to another. Right? Now, if I want to pull back a little bit from this insistence on actual magic, um, I can think of this as, well, you know, code. Right? Here it is. And that is. Yeah, eventually it will be the, let me try again. <sighs> Autofocus, come on, there we go. There is the Tower of Noy algorithm, all three steps of it. Now, it's not actually three steps. There is a fourth step, the one at the beginning, that says, Are there, is there anything to move? Right? If there is something to move, then I will recursive instead, so the, the, let me back up a little. The input to the algorithm consists of an integer n that tells you how many disks there are, and uh, descriptions of three piles, the source pile, the destination pile, and the other pile, which I'll call temp. Okay? If there are disks to move, then the first step is to recursively move n minus one disks out of the way, meaning from the source pile where they are currently, to the temporary pile. Right? And um, you tell the recursion fairy, hey, while you're doing that, you can use my destination pile as your temporary storage. Okay? Uh, then you actually do some work, you move the largest disk from source to destination, and then you tell the recursion fairy, okay, great, now all those things that you move to temp, move them to the destination, and since I'm not using it anymore, you can use the source pile as your temporary storage. Okay? Um, if n is equal to zero, if that if statement fails, the, you'll notice the algorithm correctly does nothing. Okay? The best base case is the vacuous base case. Um, now, if I were designing this algorithm from scratch, the way that I would discover that this, this, I needed to have this base case is by looking carefully at the, uh, at the recursive algorithm and saying, OK, let's back up. Um, you know, I, I want to think when I'm designing the recursive case of the algorithm that the number of disks is really big. I want to think about large inputs and how I would transform them into smaller inputs where I want to solve the same problem. So I say, oh, you know, I, I need to move the top n minus one disks to get the everything out of the way of the largest disk. Okay, but if n, I, I actually have to make an assumption about the input in order for that recursive strategy to work. Namely, there has to be a largest disk for me to move. This is the reason why we have base cases. The base cases exist precisely because there's no way to get to the point where we can invoke the recursion fairy. Hopefully then the problem is simple enough that we can just do it like that, done. Um, Sometimes it's uh, unfortunately not quite so straightforward. Okay, so um, now I have a I have a theory about one of the reasons why this point of view recursion is magic. It's the you know the recursion fairy is just another name for the induction hypothesis. 
Um, there's a strong temptation for that, that lots and lots and lots of computer scientists, and not only computer science students have, of opening up the black box and mucking around inside and trying to figure out how it's going to work instead of actually trusting the recursion fairy to do its job. Um, and this, uh, um, The, the theory is basically that, that computer, science or computer scientists are horrible at delegating anything. And maybe this is not computer scientists in general. Um, we're used to building things from the ground up. And so we think, oh, you know, if I didn't build it myself, I don't really completely trust it. Somebody else is going to solve that subproblem. And I know other people's code really sucks. <laughs> OK? Um, so um, this, th this idea of delegating tasks to other, other programs, to other programmers, this is what is commonly known as a reduction. You reduce some larger problem to a series of smaller problems, right? So um, for example, if I want to you know, take a regular expression and I want to turn it into a, a minimal DFA, right, this is the problem I want to solve. Then I look in the notes and I say, well, the first thing I can do is take my regular expression and I can turn it into an NFA. Thompson will do that for me. And then I can take my NFA and turn it into a DFA. The subset construction will do that for me. And then, we didn't talk about this in class, but um, you, there's an, as I said, there's an algorithm that can take any DFA and transform it into the minimum equivalent DFA. Either more or somebody else will do that for me. Go look in the notes. Um, and so the process of transforming a regular expression into the smallest possible DFA that accepts the same language has exactly three steps. First, you transform it into an NFA. Then you transform it into a DFA. Then you make the DFA small. And it is not important how any of those three components work. Provided those three components work, this three-step algorithm will work. It's just three steps of logic, OK? Um, more or less exactly the same length as the Tower of Hanoi algorithm. What's doubly difficult about this is that um, when you're writing a recursive algorithm, the urge not to trust the other guy who's going to solve the subproblem for you is amplified by the fact that you know that really you're the other guy. <laughs> and you're in the middle of writing the algorithm down, so you know that the other guy doesn't have code ready for you. <laughs> okay? um, this, is, this is really, this is why I recommend, why, why I recommend adopting this, um, uh, mental fiction, this viewpoint, this myth of the recursion fairy. As long as you're sure that it really is a smaller instance of exactly the same problem, it will work, provided you actually write, you know, with that assumption, provided you write the rest of the code correctly. Um, uh, if you don't actually trust this, it's because at some deep level, you don't actually believe that induction works. You don't actually believe in the recursion fairy. Um, uh, uh, and it, you know, regardless of whether you want to take this as a joke or actually take this as a, you know, a serious religious statement, it is useful to believe in the recursion fairy. It is useful to trust the recursion fairy. So when we start talking about recursive algorithms, at various points, I will say, and then you recurse. And then the recursion fairy does this thing. Um, what I'm really doing is I'm, I'm invoking something like an inductive hypothesis. And when you ask, how do I know that works? The answer is always going to be by induction. And the induction hypothesis is, the recursion fairy does its job. Okay, so um, 
recursion is reduced to you know smaller instances of the same problem are solved Need a different color. This one will do by magic. Okay. Um, so let me bring up a, 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 another algorithm uh, that you've all seen before, that you've all probably implemented before, certainly that you've all used before. Um, and I apologize for not having um, picked out the, the input to the algorithm in advance. Uh, come on. I need a T. Thank you. And I need an M. There it is. OK. So the problem that I want to talk about is everybody's favorite first problem, sorting. Scales, remember? Musicians, they practice scales. Um, OK, so I do, this, I do this every time I teach something like this. Um, I'm going to write, um, I'm going to write something down. Um, and then I'm going to ask a question, and then uh, I want somebody to name the sorting algorithm. <laughs> this used to work every time. Um, it's, it, it literally, uh, the first 10 years I, I was here, Every time I ask that question, the first word that would come out would be bubble sort, to which my response is, pretend you've never heard of that algorithm. It's never the right algorithm. <laughs> um, never, really, never. There's no, you know, no. Um, quick sort. So um, how, how does uh, quick sort work? So at a very high level, the way that, that quick sort works is the following. Um, you pick out some element of the array that you want to sort to be the pivot element, something where you're, that you're going to use to divide the element into two, the, the array into two parts. Uh, let's, uh, I want to pick out something that'll be reasonably useful, so um, let me pick out M as the pivot. Now, in the actual quick sort algorithm, this is how you choose the pivot is unspecified. Um, normally, there, you know, there's a bunch of heuristics. Uh, there's, you know, different ways that you can choose the pivot that in practice seem to do well, um, seem to make things fast, um, but if you recall, what is the definition of a heuristic in this room? An algorithm that doesn't work. None of those heuristics actually guarantee that the algorithm will be fast. Um, except for one, which therefore means it's not a heuristic. Um, okay, so the, the, the first step after you've chosen the pivot, is to split the array into three parts. One part of the array that contains everything smaller than the pivot, one part of the array that contains everything larger than the pivot, and the pivot itself sitting in the middle. Now, I'm going to imagine that we already know how to do that. Right? There's a, there's, it's not a terribly complicated task, um, but uh, it's not something that you know I want to spend a whole lot of time on, so I'm going to delegate that to um, well this piece of code. Okay. Um, the the important thing to remember is that you can do this in linear time, and you can sort of imagine how you might do it. You keep a second array and you scan. And when you see something smaller, you add it to the left side of the second array. And when you see something bigger, you add it to the right side. And eventually, the left and right side leave just enough room for the pivot to go in. Um, OK, that's step one. 
Step two is what? Sorry? What do we ask the recursion fairy to do? Okay, so we're going to call up the recursion fairy and say, hey, sort that stuff over there on the left. And I know that I can do this because that stuff over on the left is smaller than the array that I started with. It's missing at least one element, namely the pivot. Okay, so again, I am going to uh, call the recursion fairy who uh, is, you know, sorts the left side of the array. Then I call the recursion fairy again and say, hey, look at that stuff over here on the right. Look, it's smaller than the array that I started with, so I can just hand it off to you. Could you please sort that for me? Um, and then the recursion fairy says, okay. Done. Um, and then if we've arranged the data correctly when we partitioned it, this is actually all together in a single array already in sorted order. Okay? So um, the quick sort algorithm looks stop like this. Oh, come on. There we go. Um, so I choose a pivot somehow. It's unspecified. But um, yeah, fine. Choose the first element. Choose the last element. Choose the element in the middle. Then I call this partition function, which splits the array into two parts and leaves the pivot at index r. The thing that the, the value that partition returns is the position in the array of the pivot element. It started at index p, it ended at index r. And then I recursively sort everything to the left of the pivot. That's the array from the subarray from 1 to r minus 1. And then I recursively sort the array um, from r plus 1 to n. Right? And if you actually want to see uh, a, a not the prettiest, but a reasonably efficient partition algorithm. It doesn't require you to keep a secondary array. This, this actually does, does the partitioning in place. Um, it's just a while loop um, with, a, with a couple of nested things in it. Um, it takes linear time. Okay. All right. How do I know it works? Induction. The induction hypothesis says um, the recursion fairy will, in fact, correctly sort everything on the left, and the recursion fairy will correctly sort everything on the right. And so the only thing that I have left to prove is that the partition function actually works correctly. But I haven't told you how the partition algorithm works, so you just have to trust me. Right? It's a library routine that you call, and it says right here on the box that it works. So you have to trust it, right? So at, at, if, you, if you prefer to think of it this way, you can say, I've reduced the problem of sorting to the problem of partitioning the array um, into these three parts. And so as long, if you can convince me that you know how to do that partition, I will believe that I now know how to sort. Okay. All right. Um, Somebody give me another sorting algorithm. Uh -huh. <laughs> Merge sort. Let's try that. OK. Um, this is a little nicer for a couple of reasons than quick sort. Partly because the algorithm is completely specified. There are no choices that make the algorithm slower or faster. Um, it, it, it's always efficient. Um, it's a little less memory efficient than quicksort, but um, at least in terms of its um, worst case running time, it is uh, significantly better. Okay, so um, merge sort is like quicksort in the sense that it's a divide and conquer algorithm. Um, the way that quicksort does its divide and conquer is it has this special function called partition that does the divide. It divides the array into two smaller pieces, and that's really where all of the work is being done. 
is how do you arrange the array so that you have all the, all the smaller stuff, then the pivot, and then all the bigger stuff? And then the conquer part is just, well, you recurse and you're done. Okay. Merge sort is um, exactly the opposite. The divide part is trivial. I mean, intuitively, you can imagine taking the array and splitting it into two smaller pieces. But in fact, you don't move any data around when you do this. You just say, OK, in part of the algorithm, I'm going to refer to the first half of the existing array. And in other parts of the algorithm, I'm going to refer to the second half of the existing array. This is not something you actually do, but for purposes of intuition, I can move the Scrabble tiles over. OK, then there are two calls to the recursion ferry, one to sort the left half, uh, and one to sort the right half. And I know those will work because when I split the array into two smaller pieces, those pieces are smaller. Um, and now I'm left with an interesting subproblem. I'm given two sorted arrays, and now I need to be able to merge them into a single sorted array that contains all the same data. This is also a recursive algorithm. So here's how it works. If I want to merge these two, um, two sequences, what I will do in the general case is I will look at the first characters in each of those two subarrays. And whichever one is smaller, I will move to the output array. Now I'm left with two, or two sorted arrays, which I need to merge together, which in total are shorter than the two sorted arrays that I started with. And so the rest of the algorithm looks like this. You just recurse, and you're done. Except, of course, I have to actually be done. OK? Compare the two first elements, pull the smaller one out and put it in the output array, and then recursively merge everything that's left. That is how you merge two arrays. One comparison, one recursive call. OK, now, um, are there, can you imagine any cases where that recursive strategy won't work? Yeah. Right, so suppose I need to merge these two sorted sequences, one of which has length 7 and the other has length 0. So I said, what was the strategy that I said? I said, well, first you, you compare the first two elements of each of those two subarrays. So I compare the I to the segmentation fault. <laughs> OK? Um, and so that strategy won't work. So I, I have to handle this case separately. All right? Now, um, the way that I will handle this case separately is I need to copy the non-empty part into the output array. So the way that I will do that is I will copy the first element, and then I will recurse. Now, can you see any possible cases where that recursive strategy would break down? Because it's not in the right place in memory. I mean, the task is, I'm given these two sorted arrays, and I need to merge them together into a separate output array. And so I need to move the data into the output array. Now, of course, any reasonable programming language can do this in one line. right? But I'm, again, scales. I, I want to open, I want to imagine that you really are down to low level instructions. Partly because eventually we need to worry about how long the algorithm is going to take. And I don't want you to say, oh, it's one line, so therefore it's constant time. All right. There's a bunch of data that needs to move or needs to be copied. And each time you copy one unit of data, that takes one unit of time. Okay. So again, the algorithm for copying an array from one place to another is copy the first element and then recursively copy everything else. When will that recursive strategy break down? Two arrays of no elements. 
when there's no first element. So suppose I need to merge these two arrays, which are, as you can see, sorted. There are no pairs, that, you know, every pair is in the right order. It's sorted. Um, every pair is also the giraffe and the Queen of England and made of, you know, flying rainbow chocolate and everything else. But in particular, everything in here is sorted. And I need to merge these two sorted arrays into an output array that, that has all the elements together. How do I do that? Correct. Okay? So if you put all these pieces together, um, oh, come on, stop that. On. You can do it. There we go. <sighs> all right. So you put all those pieces together. Of course, when you actually implement this idea of how you merge, you're probably not going to do it recursively because you know that copy the first thing and then recurse can be unfolded into a for loop. And so in, in an actual you know, implementation, what you would do is to say, OK, I need to figure out what the next thing is to go into the output array. I'm going in the for loop here scans to the output array from 1 to n. And when I'm looking at index k, I want to say, what is the kth item that's going to go into the output array? Well, I'm maintaining an invariant that it's always going to be either be the ith element in array a or the um, jth element in array a, where j is starting in the middle. Um, and so the first couple of if statements check for the possibility that one of these two subarrays is already empty. If i is greater than m, that means my pointer into the left side of array has already passed the middle mark. I've already copied all of the left subarray into the output. Else, if j is greater than n, I've already copied the right part of the array into the output. And so those first two of statements are handling the base case of one of the arrays is empty. And then the second pair, uh, the last four lines inside the main loop, this is actually doing the, the single comparison and the, and the single copy, um, and then either incrementing um, i or j, depending on wh where you copied from. Um, the important thing to remember when you look at this, an algorithm like this and you want to prove that it's correct, you want to think about why this algorithm works, is Every time you see a loop, that's really recursion. And I know that in your other classes, you've already been told the mantra, if you have a while loop or the last thing, you, you if, do something, and then recurse on one smaller, that's tail recursion. You should unfold it into a loop. Um, I'm arguing that you should also be able to go the other direction. When you're implementing, when you're writing code, it is far more efficient to unroll things into a loop than to have the low-level system maintain all these stack frames, which are all just going to get popped off in the end anyway. Yeah, OK, maybe the compiler will do that magic for you, or maybe it won't. Um, but this code, it's easier to understand what it is doing um, meaning it's easier to explain to the bright 225 student who you're designing the algorithm for what it's doing. But if you want to convince yourself, or worse, you want to convince me that it's actually correct, the intuition that you need to keep in mind is that is a recursive algorithm. Figure out what goes in the first part of the array, and then let the recursion fairy do everything else. Because that's how the, pr that's how the proof of correctness is going to go. Okay, okay so um, sometimes when we think about recursive algorithms, we're going to express them iteratively. But really, fundamentally, under the hood, in the background, we're, we're, we're keeping in mind, oh, that's really do the first thing and then recurse to, to, to finish the loop. And then finally, here's the merge sort algorithm. Um, again, uh, we start by splitting the array in two pieces. That's the line m is um, floor of n over 2. 
all that, all that is doing is figuring out where the first piece is supposed to end. Then I call the recursion fairy to sort the part on the left. I call the recursion fairy to sort the part on the right. And then I call my friendly neighborhood merge subroutine to glue those two elements back together, those two subarrays back together into the right order. Okay. I know the recursive call to merge sort works by the induction hypothesis. I know the recursive call to merge sort works by the induction hypothesis. And I know that merge works because I already had a separate induction proof. Okay. And so everything works. Um, if you actually want to see the proof, here it is in the notes. No, the other way. Right? Yeah, it's a bunch of cases. Okay? As a general rule, we are not going to ask you to write proofs like this. All right? Um, nevertheless, I want you to be at least able to sketch a proof like this to say, okay, how would I argue in each of the cases? I look at the loop and I saw these four cases. Those four cases are going to show up as cases in my inductive argument. Um, you should know what the inductive hypothesis is that, that allows you to conclude that the algorithm is actually doing what, doing what you claim. Um, not because we're going to ask you to write it down and test you on whether or not you can, you can uh, write a proof like this. The problem with that is that it takes a long time to actually write down all the details especially on exams, you don't have that much time. Um, what I want this to be is a habit that you use when you come up with your own recursive algorithms. As a sanity check, you go, OK, am I doing the right thing? Am I arguing through why do I believe this is the right answer? Um, and this is the flip side of the, uh, this tendency that I mentioned that computer scientists hate to delegate things to other people. Nobody, nobody, we know not to trust anybody else. The flip side of this is it is far too easy to trust yourself. Right? One of the things that lots of people do when they come up with algorithms is they say, here's something, yeah, that looks like it should work. And then the next level, oh, let me try it on two instances. Let me try it on the array one, two, three. Look, it worked. Right. You have to be, you know, you want to trust the recursion fairy, but you don't want to trust yourself. Right? Or if you uh, want to adopt, you know, our form, one of our former president's maxims, trust, but verify. Okay. Um, it's important when you're designing these algorithms that you not only give it inputs that you already know are likely to work because they were the things that were driving your intuition already. What you really want to be able to do is to come up with the most bizarrely evil inputs you can because you know that's exactly what I'm going to do. Right? I will attempt to break your code. Um, and part of the reason for this is, uh, you know, uh, because, you know, if there's some part of your code that maybe is only going to be hit every, one out of every million times you execute it, that pretty much means that the planes are going to explode about once a month. That means the internet is going to go down once an hour. Okay? There, those bugs will be found. Um, part of it is that the very first time, you know, one of the best things that my undergraduate professors did in my equivalent of CS125 or ECE190, is um, one of the features of their grading algorithm was the following. If we can make your code crash, you get a zero. We will run your code, pick up the keyboard, do this, hit return. If your code crashes, you get a zero. We will feed a dot out into itself. If your code crashes, you get a zero. Um, we will feed three megabytes of dev random into your code. If it crashes, you get a zero. We will feed the empty file into your code. If it crashes, you get a zero. 
unless you can convince us it was a compiler bug. I have actually seen that defense used successfully. Um, once. Exactly once. Um, uh, which meant you just had, you, you, you couldn't just guess. You couldn't just say, ah, this will work. Ah, yeah, I freed all my malocs. Sure. Yeah, the garbage collector will be fine. Uh, you know, you know. No, you had to know because you didn't want to risk getting a zero in a class where the programming assignments were 50% of your grade. <laughs> getting a zero on one of those things is like half a letter grade in the course. So if we can make your code crash, you get a zero. I'm not going to be that harsh. Um, uh, but I am going to come up with lots of evil examples to say, really? Does your algorithm correctly sort the empty array? Does your algorithm correctly sort an array of all, everything is the same? Um, uh, because that's what happens out in the real world. Every little corner case, every little thing that you didn't think of, someone else will think of. All right. Um, so that's, you know, recursive sorting as far as, you know, how you think about the algorithm. The recursive calls are somebody else's business. They're magic. Recursion fairy waves is magic wand and they're done. Um, uh, but there's another side when we're thinking about designing an, an, an algorithms, which is we have to figure out how fast the algorithm is. What's the running time of the algorithm? Um, now, as you probably already know, um, running time doesn't come in units. Right? Time, this is not time in the same sense that a physicist means time. And running time is not something that you measure in seconds or even in cycles. Uh, running time is sort of the number of elementary operations where the executes as a function of the input size, which invariably I will denote by the letter n. Um, and moreover, because sometimes different inputs of the same size will lead an algorithm to run faster or slower, you know, if you put a check at the beginning of quicksort that says, if it's already sorted, just stop, then in the best case, the array is sorted, and you run through it once, and you stop, and the algorithm runs in linear time. But in the normal case, it's going to take longer than that. Nobody cares about the best case. The best case will never happen. Right? It is a horrible, dirty, malicious world. Everyone really is out to get you. You need to design defensively, not only against people who are going to come up with strange inputs that test the correctness of your algorithm, but um, strange inputs that test uh, the efficiency of your algorithm. Now again, out in the real world, outside this room, this is not actually the most appropriate metric to use. Um, in practice, in a lot of circumstances when you're designing algorithms, um, you uh, know something about the input, either because you can prove something about where the input comes from, or because experimentally you verify that the input has certain properties. And be with those assumptions, you can say, well, you know what, I don't have to design for the worst case input. I can design only for inputs that meet those assumptions, right? Um, and so a standard example of, of this um, discrepancy is um, what is the running time of quicksort? So what is the running time of quicksort? I've heard at least two answers so far. Anyone want to go for the third? End of the 1.5. No, that's not the one I was looking for. Uh, um, Quicksort runs in n squared time. 
Why? Right, so if, for example, I just by, you know, I got unlucky, and every single time I chose a pivot, I chose the smallest element in the array as a pivot, okay? Then uh, if I always choose the, the, the smallest possible pivot, then the running time of the algorithm when I have to end things to sort, well, that's going to be um, order n, because that's how long it takes to do the partition, and then uh, I call the recursion ferry on everything larger than the pivot. Now, when I call the recursion ferry, that means I have the same function t on the right side of the equality here, but with a smaller argument. Um, and so I get a recurrence for the for the the running time of this algorithm in the case where I actually choose the smallest pivot every single time. Now, um, you might argue, in practice, you're not going to choose the smallest pivot every single time. And I will reply, if you let me read your code and then give you input, I will give you the smallest pivot every single time. Okay. Um, so uh, it may be true in practice, but in this room, yeah, it's, if it could happen, you should just assume that it will. Um, and this recurrence is going to expand um, out to um, n squared. Right? It's basically, I'm going to have n plus, and then I'll open up the recurrence. No, I'm not going to open up the recurrence. What am I thinking? Um, I'm going to have n here, and then by the recursion ferry, uh, something lo looking like n minus 1 squared, and I do a little bit of math, and I get something that looks like n squared. I, I will go through a more interesting example of solving recurrences in a second. Okay. Um, about merge sort. Well, Everybody knows that merge sort runs in n log n time, but let's actually prove it. Okay. So I'm going to write down this function t of n that represents the running time of merge sort when I have an array of size n. And well, what does merge sort do? Um, I'm going to make two calls to merge sort each on an array of size n over 2. And then I'm going to merge the two sorted arrays back together. That takes linear time because it's just a for loop. Okay. Now, if I already know that the answer is n log n, how would I prove it? Induction. We're not going to do that because it's actually easier to do something else. It's actually easier to figure out the solution to this recurrence from scratch than it is to prove that a, a given solution is correct. Um, and the way that we're going to solve um, this is using a technique um, called um, recursion trees. Okay? So, um, if you imagine running merge sort on an actual computer where recursive calls are not done by magic, but they're actually done by the computer, um, you can visualize the behavior of the algorithm by saying, OK, look, um, I need to do merge sort on an array of size n. Um, that's going to reduce to doing merge sort on an array of size n over 2, doing merge sort on an array of size n over 2, um, and then plus, I'm going to do a linear amount of work. Let's put that down here in the middle. Um, in the middle. Okay. So, merge sort is going to recursively sort, sort on the left, recursively sort on the right, and, and um, do a linear amount of work in the middle. So, I'm going to take, and if you, you know, expand this out, you're eventually going to get a nice little complete binary tree um, where at every single leaf, you're reduced down to an array that has exactly one element. Okay. Um, so I'm going to visualize the running time of the algorithm using exactly the same structure. 
right? I'm going to build a tree. And up here in the corner, I'm going to write what I'm trying to figure out. I'm trying to figure out the running time t of n according to this recurrence. Okay, now there are three parts to the running time. There's um, a recursive call, a t of n over 2, and another recursive call, t of n over 2. And then there's the non-recursive part, which I'm going to just write here. And I'm going to write it without the big O. I know that I can do this because I've worked through the math and it always works. Um, I, you know, I could, if I really wanted to, prove it to you. Um, but the, the TLDR here is when you're solving these recurrences, erase all the big O's until the very end. Okay. Okay, so this is a pattern which I now want to apply recursively. So if I want to figure out what t of n over 2 is, well, I'm going to do exactly the same thing that I did for t of n. I'm going to split, or rather the recursion theory is going to split the problem into two subproblems in size n over 4, and then I'm going to do n over 2 work here um, in the non-recursive part. Right, there's some function of the input size that goes into the box. In this case, it's just n over 2. Okay, n over 2, and then I'm going to recurse. And now you can kind of guess what's going to happen. I'm going to get this huge binary tree with one node for each recursive call, including the initial call to the word sort, where at that node in the tree, I write down the amount of time that I spend actually in that stack frame, within, that sc within the scope of this call, not in the scope of any further recursive calls downwards, not in the scope of any of my parent recursive calls. But this is the amount of time that I spend with that call being the one that's actually executing. Okay. Now, if I want, my, my goal now is to sum up all of the values in all of the nodes. Every CPU cycle that I use is going to be spent inside one of these calls. Right? So I just need to sum up everything that's in the tree. The way the recurrence is structured is well, this is everything in the left subtree plus everything in the right subtree plus the root. The way I'm going to solve this, this problem is I'm going to sum up the recurrences level by level. I'm going to sum up the costs level by level. So at level 0, there's only one node, and the total amount of work done at that node is n. At level 1, I have two nodes, each where doing n over 2 work, so the total amount of work that I do at level 1 is n. There are four nodes at level two in the tree, so the total amount of work that I do at level two is n. You see a pattern? How much work am I going to do at the kth level of the tree? n. How would you prove that? Induction. The total amount of work that I do at level k is equal to the total amount of work I do at level k minus one, because Every node does the same amount of work as its two children put together. Therefore, by induction, every level is the same. Um, and so the, the total amount of work is going to be n times the number of levels in this tree, the depth or the height of the tree. OK, what's the height of the tree? Log n. Um, this is, right, n log n. And now that the smoke is cleared, I'll put the big O back. Um, now, you can ask, there's a reasonable question, why, why is that number of levels log n? And the answer I will give you may be somewhat unsatisfying, but it's actually fairly accurate. A working definition of log n is the number of times you can divide n by 2 before you get an answer that's less than 1. 
And this is exactly the circumstance that determines how deep the tree is. I start with n, and when I go down, I divide n by 2. And when I go down, I divide n by 2. And when I go down, I divide n by 2. And when I go down, I divide n by 2. And when, I, when do I stop going down? When do I stop recursing? I stop recursing when the size of the subproblem is either too small for the recursive strategy to work at all, n equals 1, or small enough that I'm going to say, you know what, I can sort it array arrays of size 10 using selection sort faster, so I'm going to bottom out at 10. OK, fine. Right. Um, now, you can quibble over whether the depth of the tree is actually log n, log n minus 1, log n over 4. None of that matters, because in the end, you're going to put a big O around it. If you're dividing by 2 until you get down to a constant, you're going to do that log n times. Um, one of the reasons why I prefer doing this technique from scratch instead of using induction is because really if I want to push an induction proof through, I have to decide what this constant inside the big O actually is, and I have to decide whether I really mean log n or log n over 2 or ceiling of log n minus 1 or something else. Right. Um, so in this case, I'm going to delegate to math I've already done. Um, there's a whole handout in, on the, on the web page about, about um, how to actually solve these, which goes into lots more excruciating detail. Um, it works. How many of, of you have heard of something called the Master Theorem? How many of you remember what it is? I don't believe you. I don't. I don't, uh, no, I mean the statement of the Master Theorem. I don't remember the statement of the Master Theorem. What I remember is how you prove the Master Theorem. You prove it using recursion trees. But if I just start by doing recursion trees, um, as you'll see once we go through more examples, there are only a few different patterns that can show up 99% of the time. Um, and for each of those patterns, there's a simple rule of thumb for what you do. Okay. Um, so, quick sort runs in n squared time, merge sort runs in n log n time. Um, now, I'm not going to have enough time to, to more than hint at this, but I do want to go back and, and think about quick sort a little bit more. Okay. Okay, this is a sentence that I hear uttered um, many, many times in many different contexts. Yeah, okay, in worst case, it's n squared. But in practice, it's n log n. Um, okay, so as a mathematical statement, this is completely meaningless unless you define what the phrase in practice means. There's a particular formalism that sometimes um, people use which um, is actually mathematically correct. Which is that uh, quicksort runs in n log n time um, on average uh, if the data is randomly permuted. In other words, if every permutation of the input data is equally likely, then um, the, the average behavior of quicksort, subject, you know, modulo that random choice, is n log n. This is correct. Um, it is, in fact, true that if every permutation of the input is equally likely, if what I'm sorting is, you know, a deck of cards from a Las Vegas casino, and they work really, really hard to make sure that every permutation is as close to equally likely as possible, then yeah, quick sort's going to be pretty good. It's going to be as fast as merge sort. Okay. Um, the problem is that uh, people often use this 
as a rationalization of why they're using quicksort instead of something that's actually faster. They say, oh, well, the data's random, so um, it'll be n log n. Saying that the input data is permuted, every permutation equally likely, that's an extraordinarily strong claim about the input data, which you can only make if you actually already know and can either verify experimentally or prove that it holds. Most real world data is not uniformly random. The entire field of machine learning is I choose some data from a random distribution that I don't know. Let me see if I can figure out what that distribution is. If the answer were always uniform, a few thousand people would have really boring jobs. Okay. Um, uh, the entire field of machine learning is, I know it's a random distribution, but I, I don't know what it is. I certainly can't assume that it's uniform. Um, Again, it's also, this also fits with this notion of you know, designing your algorithms adversarially. Um, even if the first context where you apply your, your code, the data is you know, permuted randomly, someone's going to use your code somewhere else. You have no way of knowing how your code's going to be used in advance. And if you're unlucky, I'm going to be the one to use your code. And uh, my data is not uniformly random. My data is designed to make your code slow. Um, there's a way of fixing this. which is don't assume that the real world is randomly permuted. Randomly permute the data. If you want to assume something about the random distribution of your data, make it so. Enforce random distribution. Shuffle the deck before you sort it. Okay? Then um, everything, act this actually goes through. Now, I know the deck is randomly sorted because, uh, randomly ordered, because I randomly ordered it. I didn't just assume that it would be randomly ordered by nature. Okay. Um, now, the reason why when things are randomly ordered, n log n ends up being the running time, I'm sorry, there was a question over here. Yes, but with very, very small probability. And the probability is going to be so small that it's not going to affect the expected running time. There's a tiny probability of getting something that's bad. But it's so small that if you discover that you're doing something bad, OK, just shuffle the array again and start over. And if you play with the numbers the right way, you know, depending on how bad bad is, yeah, shuffling a deck of cards and expecting to get it in, in, in sorted order is slightly less likely than whatever computer you're implementing quicksort on of just randomly turning into a kitten. So we, you don't want to, we don't really need to worry about that. Now, the reason why um, random permutation is good is that when you choose a pivot, no matter where you choose it, it's equally likely to be anywhere in the array. And so it's fairly likely to be somewhere in the middle. If only there were some way of choosing a pivot that was always guaranteed to be in the middle. We'll do that on Tuesday. All right.